Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Innovation Deciphered. Today I'm joined by a very good friend of mine, Mark Bendelow, who I've known since 1987. He's had an illustrious career in the UK and all around the world and his speciality is commercial management. So enjoy. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Innovation Deciphered and I'm really pleased to be joined by a very old friend of mine, Mark Bendelow. Hi Mark and welcome. Hi Tim, glad to be here. So Mark and I have known each other, we were just checking before we started filming, since 1987. Correct. So a long, long time. Um, I think we were speculating, it was before our editor and director Ashley and Harvey's parents probably met mm -hmm. maybe still at school or something but that's how long ago so between us we've got uh, memories that stretch right back deep into the last century and really that's the the point of today we're trying to get a perspective of, from you and I know we've got some shared experience along the, the way around innovation and how it applies to not just construction projects but to construction companies mm -hmm. And we first met all those years ago at a company that, that was then called Cementation Pining and Foundations. You now it's part of the Skanska Group, has been for 20 odd years. So, back in the day, what was your perspective? Because the Cementation did have a strategy which was sort of around innovation, wasn't it? Okay, so just to say, um, I started with uh, Cementation as a quantity surveyor and uh, working with a quality company, I worked my way up and eventually I became the commercial director of the business. The, uh, the directors changed many times over those years and uh, in the board that I was on there was a desire to try and differentiate ourselves strongly. In fact there was a need to try and do that. Uh, construction companies very often in the nature of the, the industry quite often find themselves chasing themselves down to the bottom of whatever it is especially on price and we wanted to differentiate ourselves and justify why Cementation was a better company to go with. And uh, one of the ways that we wanted to try and do that uh, was innovation and that led us on to trying to understand intellectual property a bit better which came under me and uh, we developed a strategy around that because it's not necessarily about the widget you invent a Hoover, a Dyson, whatever. It's uh, also about how the market perceives you as a company that can deal with their issue. And uh, it was more on that side. Yes, we did invent widgets, and widgets were a big part of it. Um, but we also had a, a, an approach to how we were placed in the marketplace. That, that, uh, so we had, we had yes, we had uh, particular things uh, uh, which were unique. Uh, we were a direct. We had a direct works operation with a lot of investment in plant, which was a big area, and uh, people and uh, engineers and design engineers and plant engineers, big workshops, and people were putting together ideas and solutions to things. But they didn't realise that uh, they were innovating, and maybe they were actually inventing. And that was a big step forward to say, right, okay, well, we're innovating, we want people to recognise that. Then we started talking about maybe we're inventing. Then we started talking about, oh, well, we want to take a patent out uh, around this because you create a monopoly around your own special thing. And we want to protect that. And then we had to realise that there was a cultural difference between how engineers in the broadest sense, whether plant or geotechnical or civil, civil engineers, they approach a thing and they think that they're using empirical approaches. They don't put a high value on uh, inventing, but they do put a high value on innovating. So they like to innovate to solve, solve problems, but they don't realise they're actually inventing. And to invent or to have intellectual property or patents, you have to be inventive and novel. And they don't realise that they're being novel very often. And so we had to start thinking about and talking about, um, right, we need to align our business because one of the rules of taking out patents is 
but you haven't spread it out into the market. And of course, that's exactly what we were doing. We were tendering for projects and we were saying, ah, to solve this particular problem, we've come up with this great idea, uh, innovative or inventive, sometimes inventive, very often innovative. And here it is. This is the special thing that we're going to do. We write it all down and give it away for nothing. Yeah, or to win the project, uh, uh, fair enough. And uh, so we said, well, we need to be very careful about that. So when they started to think about uh, the strategy, if we want to differentiate ourselves and to be uh, innovative, innovative, inventive and novel is a good way to differentiate yourself. And you can, you can sell it. You can, it's part of your profile. So we started to think about two things. One is how do we protect the inventions and how do we place and position ourselves as a, a, an innovative and inventive company? And so that was the strategy. We wanted to have that level of awareness. And then we also wanted to protect some things. So to go back to where I started that, and it's a little bit psychical, but where we started that was we had to get all the innovators and inventors aligned behind the idea that don't just go writing it down and sending a tender in. If you think you've got an inventive idea, or even if you don't, you, you think you have been, you're not sure, then let's talk about it, let's talk to specialists about it. Can we see a patentable idea or several claims around this thing, which means that it would be patentable? So nowadays, you're talking about a nascent uh, innovation management system or process. Mm. It's only recently, in the last couple of years, there's been an international standard developed to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. ISO 56002. Mm -hmm. Not many businesses yet got it. Skanska mm -hmm. actually has. Um, mm -hmm. the, which is well, yeah, there's, there's, there was a BS before that, and I can't remember the number of it. There may have been, but it's the international one that's been promoted by mm -hmm. BSI now. I'm right. glad to say we've got it right. for our business. Congratulations. I'm very pleased about that. Thank you. But of course, you're right. It's it's having the systems and processes, and then you need the culture to support the ideas coming forward, and all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And you've then got to be able to deal with if you get lots. How do you deal with sorting out the wheat from the chaff? Because because uh -huh. you're you're right. You can suddenly turn your business from being a pining company into an ideas company. Mm -hmm. Which actually, in the long run, might be the best thing to do, but of course, it creates all sorts of problems, doesn't it? Potentially. Yes. Well, uh, we tried to. We started off with encouraging everybody to be uh, innovative in whatever they were doing, and to try and be efficient, or to try and come up with new ways of doing things. And it did lead to an, a need to try and control it. For example, we had a competition. You could. You know, you could get prizes for being inventive, best invention of the year, or innovation of the year. I think, Tim, you might have even won it uh, some years. Don't recall. <laughs> uh, but the thing was, you have to be careful it doesn't just get out of hand and somebody sees it as a second income stream. I mean, if their job is to be innovative and inventive, that's their job. Yeah. So there was a little bit of an HR issue around that, I have to be honest. But once we... Once we got on top of, we need to control innovation and invention, and we also need to control expectations, but maintain a positive idea that we really, really encourage it, then that was okay. We, we got through that. There were one or two people that tried to take advantage of it, and they said, well, actually, this is not really the way it works. But we, we got there eventually. Because when you do new things, side effects have got a habit of popping out. It's a thing you don't think about. It's the, the unexpected consequences yeah, of change. Yeah. And that, that can happen to any business with any initiative. Can. I'm just thinking back to those days. There, there were all sorts of really interesting things that came out of it in terms of products mm -hmm. and services, new mm -hmm. services. What we often find is in the work that we do now is you people get to the point where they're finding the the innovation or the invention often they then even if they've identified it decided which ones to back possibly protect uh, using whichever ip device is appropriate the next thing that often you see is not great in construction is how they exploit it mm -hmm. but, but that's a 
Mm -hmm. That's more to do with the marketing issue. Mm -hmm. really. And also how the business responds to actually this new IP, which is there to be exported. It's an asset. It mm -hmm. should be producing money. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's that's when we met, wasn't it? In those days. In those days, days. yes. You moved on from the pining industry into utilities mm -hmm. uh, for a few years. What did you see there in terms of innovation? Well, I was only there for three years, but I, I would say the, the main innovation there was around how contracts were organised and how uh, flexible they had to be. Because one of the big things about utilities, one is that you can have thousands of tasks and how do you manage that under the contract? And then, you can, and then in a framework contract, you're going to have thousands of little tasks and then suddenly you have a great big task, which is actually a project in its own right, as you would recognise, construction. And they uh, got very uh, heavily into using all the options of the NEC form of contract, which came out round about that time as well, or was well in uh, when I got involved in it. And uh, so they were flexible and, and innovative in how they applied it. And so they had contracts with multiple forms of uh, contract administration being applied, the, the NEC options. And of course, that's really demonstrating innovation doesn't just have to be technical, does it? No. It can be process as well. Yeah, it was the process. Was commercial process. Uh, and it wasn't inventive because somebody had sat down and put into one document all the different types of contract it administration. Balance, because, wasn't it, who came out uh, the NEC? Yeah, lots of people. He, was the, he led it. But of course, nowadays you see how people have taken those and they've created online platforms to manage these things, mm -hmm. and that's how, in that particular thing, you see you see it a lot now. That mm -hmm. those, that's where innovations. Yeah, well, those the, sorts of NEC. Issues. The big thing that was for much wider use was the target cost approach, but then that was already in uh, the IKME form of contract. It was just for that market and it appeared to be too complicated or people were used to doing something else and maybe that's a, a thing about being innovative and inventive it brings change it brings new thought processes new reflexes that people have to get their head around and uh, so suddenly what was GC Works no but not pardon GC Works an IKME form of contract was oh so this mechanism is going to be all over the UK sales market wow yeah that was a major, major change. And people who had been to college and had 20 years experience were suddenly thinking, I don't know how to do these sums. In fact, I don't even know how to read the document. So was... And I can say that over the years, that then led to, you're right, it took ages for people to get their heads around it. Yeah. A long time. And of course, the people who are slightly ahead of the curve started to game it. Yeah. First of all, you saw crafty contractors gaming uh, it and then you then saw the risk the response to that from clients who then started gaming it back and forth and you know I think that was, at the end of the day doesn't help anyone but that's mm -hmm. that's just human nature I, I was I think that's very unfortunate and I saw that in spades and I wouldn't name names but uh, two extremes yeah and I thought yeah, we've completely lost the underlying thread of the NEC form of contract here that it's meant to be equitable and people are gaming it to an extent where they were exploiting it. Yeah. yeah. I've both sides, the, both sides of the contract. I or think. else you had flipped back effectively to the same adversarial uh, situation, but uh, it was just now much more complicated in the reward side. Oh, well, that's not really helping at all. So that was my personal uh, perspective, yeah. and it's probably one of the reasons why when the opportunity came along to go international, I did, and I've given you a line there, Tim. See, <laughs> you've just thrown me a line, which is great. So after a long career in the UK, you then get the opportunity to work overseas, and uh, we'll, we'll name names. It was, it was BAM International, and I think it literally meant all continents. Yes, uh, BAM International were involved in all continents and uh, we'd certainly tendered in South America. I'm not 100% sure we did any physical work in South America. We did work in Panama, I think that counts as North America, and in Costa Rica, very close by, next door, and the Antarctica and all over. There can't be many QSs who end up doing a job on an out in Antarctica. No, but there's a few who were working out of Cambridge who did very well and worked very hard. 
yeah, with the guys at Nuttall, so all good guys. Now, brilliant. So let's just talk, so this career overseas, I know you did lots of work in, you'd mentioned sort of Central America, whether it's slightly north or south, Yeah. neither here nor there. You said in North America and Canada, Canada yeah. the Middle East, yeah, Antarctica. UAE and Jordan and Antarctica, with, with the NEC form of contract was being used in many forms. Uh, and that was an interesting sort of development on from the framework contracting thing. Indonesia, uh, Australia, big projects in Australia, um, uh, Africa, large road jobs, uh, airports in Africa, jetties in, uh, during Ebola in uh, Sierra Leone, that was interesting, and uh, strangely London City Airport as well. So in our career, and we've worked, um, obviously I've worked extensively in the UK, I've done bits and pieces in the Middle East, Canada, we've got business over there, you know that market quite well. Um, in terms of the perception of innovation on projects, do you, do you see differences where, you know, in terms of culture and the perception of it, uh, yeah. so between the UK and Canada, well, the UK and Australia would be interesting, I think, to our listeners. Um, yes, very much so. And the per perception of intellectual property, I would say that oh, that's been my experience that the UK is leading that. Uh, I think there are some very notable exceptions, especially in the plant industry. You can imagine that there's a lot of uh, uh, very clever engineering going on with piling equipment, for example, but all sorts of different uh, equipment and uh, uh, but that uh, strategy that I was talking about of being aware of differentiating yourself through innovation or invention was not so prevalent and so in BAM International for example uh, I told the story we had a you have the strategic workshop you talk about we need to differentiate ourselves we had exactly the same scenario about chasing the price down to the bottom we need to create a differentiation and we want to be recognised is bringing something to the party and there was a record we went through exactly the same loop the engineers are innovating and, and sometimes inventing but innovating like crazy and we're not getting recognized enough for it we're just using it as a hopefully a, a way of driving down the cost and we're not using it to make it clear that we're the only ones that can really do this job and uh, and and in that way they wanted the cementation experience and unfortunately uh, 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 it's their, cho their call, but Royal Bam Group eventually said we don't want to be an international anymore, we want to reconsolidate, that's all in the press, and so we didn't follow that strategy through. But that was the thought process, for sure. And in the different countries, in, in Australia, um, Australia is quite like, uh, it sort of falls in behind America, it's very much driven by the legal profession and its contracting, which is quite interesting. So you do get some questions around, oh, are you, is this your intellectual property and so on. But I wouldn't have said that they were actually doing the same strategy as we were doing at Cementation. And then uh, and, uh, in other countries, it's not so recognised. So in China, it's not really recognised. South Africa, not really recognised. Uh, European countries, yes, more recognised. What we found in America. Canada, for instance, it depends which sector you're working in. Mm. The oil and gas sector, which is big in Canada, oh. clients are very interested in mm -hmm. uh, capturing any IP that's created yeah. on the project, whereas most construction clients are silent on the matter. We've seen there. Well, we did work at Kitimat in Canada uh, for LNG works and oil and gas obviously involved there. And yes, you would see in their contracts quite big sections about anything you invent for this job is ours and that kind of thing, putting it bluntly. You know why they do that? That's tax driven. Right, so they're doing it for tax reasons. Well, they? that's what's driven it because right. in Canada, their tax code, um, this is in relation to R&D tax credit, so for the viewers who are maybe bored of hearing me talking about it, it's quite, you're going to learn something now, that Canada invented R&D tax credits in 1983 right. and the UK adopted it 17 years later. Right. But in Canada, one of their qualifying criteria is you have to own the IP. Yeah. If it's not mentioned in the contract, you own it, if you've created it. Yeah. So what you see in the more switched on 
sectors, oil and gas is a prime example, mm -hmm. is that they will capture that, which means that they have, then have the opportunity to make a research and development mm -hmm. claim. Mm -hmm. uh, if they've done that, you can't claim yourself. So, I mean, that means that you really need to be aware of what you're doing before you find yourself in the middle of a project and inventing or innovating. Yeah, so uh, there's, there are, I wouldn't say ways around it, but there's ways of dealing with it. But essentially, that is the qualifying criteria there. Mm -hmm. If your contract says the client owns the IP, then you can't have done any. Well, you've been paid the R&D, and therefore you can't claim it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's just a quirk. But it shows you how the tax code can, in, can uh, influence construction contracts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is... Um, that might be an insight that people haven't realised before. In Canada, I'm talking about. It's not quite like that here. Yeah, I mean, intellectual property and innovation and invention doesn't come without costs. So it's an equation that you have to balance up in whatever way that you can. Either you manage your budget, you set a budget. You, I know like you said earlier on, you have to choose which ones you're going for. You don't patent everything if you don't think you're going to get a patent. What's the point of going through all the patent process only to be rejected at the last minute. So No, and of course on projects it happens very fast. If you need to innovate to get out of you know mm -hmm. the CAC. Mm -hmm. The innovation's happening, it's being socialised before you've possibly got exactly. to protect yeah. it. And therefore that kind of innovation, even if it's invention, is very hard to protect because you have to move so fast. Yeah. Um, well, it's a difficult for an international business because your socialising is taking place so far away from the centre, uh, but it was easier with cementation of a UK-focused business, and most of the people who were innovating uh, or inventing were either involved in uh, the uh, pre-contract phase or the design phase, which is mostly pre-contract, or in the uh, uh, plant side of things. And so, uh, in terms of sp spreading the word, preaching the gospel, you could eat more easily actually encourage them to think, oh, is this an invention? Is this an innovation? That could be an invention. And uh, so in that way, they would come to you and say, well, before we do this, how about that? And uh, and that was became part of the culture then. And and uh, however we chose to actually push it forward, that people were asking about it, a little bit more difficult in, in an international business. But I mean, they were at the start of the journey. So yeah. it would have been interesting to see how that played out. But we'll never know. Unfortunately, but there are other businesses doing other yes. things and they will come to it eventually, and I'm sure. And uh, when they analyse their business and say, well, how do we differentiate ourselves? We're fed up being pushed to the bottom of the line. We want to be in this, well, usually a higher quality uh, uh, niche. And uh, you end up saying, well, we, we produce inventive or uh, uh, novel things. And so we wanted that to be recognised. And I think... If you take a sort of strategic view about any business, but certainly in construction, we know this to be the case, that really to survive, you need to continuously be certainly innovating mm -hmm. to improve your systems, processes, the way mm -hmm. you do things. Uh, and if you have a great idea that's really inventive and novel, mm -hmm. you should be creating IP from that yes. and then protecting it, yes. protecting that IP, yeah. which isn't a well-understood concept in construction. Certainly. Well, a lot of people don't believe that it's got a place because they're too focused on the widget and they're not focused enough that this is actually an important part of the strategy. Yeah, it's all about the here and now yeah. and the, this project. Or this particular project or not, this particular problem. No, there could be an income stream here for 20 years. Yeah, or, or, the, or how clients actually perceive you. Oh, it's it's in, it's, 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 it's in the whole, isn't it? It's, it's around whole, it's a holistic thing. Yeah. What you think about yourself, uh -huh. what your clients and your competitors, your peer group, your supply chain think of you. Are you well? That's uh, attractive. Uh, well, I think there is a well. That's a, I think there is an a, an added benefit that you just touched on it and pricked my conscience. I mean, I've been talking a lot about how clients perceived us, but I think also when you're recruiting graduates or you're recruiting people from the market. And they say, oh, I want to go to a top tier company as we perceive ourselves. Uh, then they all want to go to a company that is uh, creative, innovative, inventive. 
that, 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 that takes notes on it because people think I'm going to learn something there. You know, what, where, where, where did that come from? And what was the process of developing it? Will I be allowed to do something like that? And of course, we said, well, yes, you will be, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that is a big attractor, particularly for young people. Yeah. Uh, always has been, and certainly is nowadays. Yeah. Anyway, Mark, that's been a whistle stop tour of a long and prosperous career in the UK <laughs> and all around the world. I'm not so sure about the prosperous part, but okay. Yeah, Thanks very much for coming on. And. Bye everyone. Thank see you, you at the much. next see you on the next episode.